Shawty made that ass clap, she don't need no applause High fashion, like go, y'all G-Wagon, or the Rover I put some ice on you cause you got a cold heart I know I gotta keep my shawty on go, go Drop that ass to the floor Shawty made that ass clap, she don't need no applause High fashion, like go, y'all G-Wagon, or the Rover I put some ice on you cause you got a cold heart I know I gotta keep my shawty on go, go Drop that ass to the floor. Drop that on that beat. Shawty made that ass clap. She don't need no clothes. High fashion, like go y'all. G wagon or the Rover. I put some ice on you 'cause you got a cold. I know I gotta keep my shawty on go. Drop that ass to the floor. Drop that on that beat. Shawty made that ass clap. She don't need no clothes. High fashion, like go y'all. G wagon or the Rover. I put some ice on you 'cause you got a cold. I know I gotta keep my Shawty made that ass clap, she don't need no I put some ice on you cause you got a cold heart I know I gotta keep my shawty on go Drop that ass to the floor yeah. ah, whoa. You ain't gotta deal with none of these niggas no more If we hop in the bins, is that okay? Is it okay if I call you my powder baby? I ain't no player, I just got a lot of faith But let me tell you, I like you a lot, babe. I wanna start at the top and the bottom, babe. Now you want the shoe with the red at the bottom, babe. You know I like when you're right at the top. If I hit it front of back, she gon' hit the sidewalk. If she got a best friend with her, take her back to my law. Got a five in the morning, wild and wild. And then they made Megan, but she a stallion, stallion. Never keep my hoes divided. Remember, I was pulling up in the valley. And you know, I take a soul when she ride. Sweater and the sneakers all kids, oh. Shot it, know to drop it low like a limbo. Every time we kick it like tempo. Shot it, made that ass clap, she don't need no applause. No. I put some ice on you, cause you got a cold heart. I know I gotta keep my shorty on go go. Okay. Drop that ass to the floor, floor, yeah. Shorty made that ass clap, she don't need no applause. High fashion, like go y'all. G wagon or the Rover. I put some ice on you, cause you got a cold heart. I know I gotta keep my shorty on go go. Drop that ass to the floor, floor, yeah. Ah, whoa. You ain't gotta do with none of these. Having the beans, is that okay? Is it okay if I call you my proud of I ain't no player, I just got a lot of bait. But let me tell you, I like you a lot, babe. I wanna start at the top and the bottom, babe. Now you want to shoot with the red at the bottom, babe. You know I like when you're right at the top, babe. Okay, class. Good evening. I'm Varika Mitchell, and I'm one of the cheer women for the Pride section. Uh, hey, everybody. Gary Ragsdale. I am a senior, and I am the co director, major in psychology. Hello everyone, my name is Darian Bingham. I'm a junior. My role in this documentary was to be a part of the research team. Hello everybody, I am Keyshawna Williams. I was, I am a chairwoman for the Greek Life segment and I was a part of the Mental Health Committee as well. And I am a sophomore majoring in psychology. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lawrence Parker Jr. I'm a graduating senior majoring in psychology. I was responsible for the mental health segment and also as well as the Black History segment with HBCUs. Hi, my name is Brianna Burns. I'm a junior. I major in psychology. I was I served as the, on the committee as the psycho. No, I'm sorry. I served on a committee 
for the HBCU history section as well as the mental health section and Greek life. Hey everyone, my name is Leah Freeney. I am a graduating senior from Chicago, majoring in sociology. I was the director of this documentary. And also we ask during this documentary that you please keep your phones on mute. Hi, I'm Dr. Alexis Davis, and I am the um, professor for psychology of film, television, and other media. We also have behind the scenes working is Ms. Carmen Bradford, who's also the editor for the documentary. Um, we just wanted to make one small notice that when the documentary starts, there's going to be one segment that does not have some music due to some um, exporting issues. But once you get into the documentary, the beat is going to drop. So we are thankful for you all being here, and we look forward to having Q&A with you all after the documentary. And there's also a live section for the people that's watching on Zoom, and we'll be answering any questions you have during the documentary. Now, thank you. With all due respect, I would like for you all to silence and mute your phones and prepare for the documentary. Thank you. For today's class, I would like for you all to work on the strategic plan for your documentary. All right, guys, so we're going to go ahead and talk about the uh, documentary. So uh, we all agreed that we're going to title it HBCU ish Media versus Reality. And then the purpose of it is to differentiate media's point of view of HBCUs versus actual reality. So everybody's cool with that? Everybody likes that idea? Yeah, I should, I should. I should. I should. Okay, cool. So we I attend the Philander Smith College. So the title of our documentary is called HBCU-ish um, Media versus Reality. It's a kind of like a spinoff of Blackish um, and Grownish. And basically in this documentary, the purpose is to discuss um, and differentiate the differences between how media portrays HBCUs versus how you know, it actually is to attend an HBCU and the reality of attending HBCU. And we're getting that perspective from current HBCU students such as myself, um, alumni who have attended HBCUs, um, and really just anyone who is HBCU related. So we just really want to get everyone's perspective um, on what it's like to attend an HBCU. We want the good, the bad, the indifferent. Um, specifically our tone for the documentary is that we want it to be funny, you know, we want it to be raw and unfiltered. Uh, we don't want to hold back. Um, that's important for us because our story about why we chose to attend an HBCU and how it is to attend an HBCU, a part of that, you know, is addressing the things that aren't so glamorous all the time and to address, you know, some of the issues that we have being HBCU students. Um, so we want to get the good, like I said, the bad, the indifferent, we want to get all of that in there because, you know, that's the reality of being an HBCU student. It isn't always peaches and cream. You're gonna have issues, but you know, um, we love our HBCU and, you know, we wouldn't have chosen any other institution. Want to get the good. 
Prior to the Civil War, there were no structured higher education systems for blacks in America. While there were institutions that catered to the education of blacks, these institutions had to run illegally and initially their mission was to provide elementary and secondary schooling for students who had no previous education. In the early 1900s is when HBCUs, also known as historically black colleges and universities, shifted their curriculum to the post-secondary level. The enactment of the Second Moral Act in 1890 lended support of higher education for black students. From this act, 16 black institutions were designated as land-grant colleges, offering courses in agricultural, mechanical, and industrial subjects, with few offering college-level courses and degrees. By 1935, well-known black institutions were booming with 32,000 students enrolled in private black institutions, 43,000 students enrolled in public black institutions, and 3,200 students enrolled in graduate programs at HBCUs. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 ensured equality in federally assisted programs and activities. This protected students from discrimination based on race, color, or national origin in programs or activities that required federal financial assistance. Congress defines a historically black college or university as a school established prior to 1964 whose sole principal mission was and is the education of black Americans. Currently today, there are 101 HBCUs across the United States as well as the U.S. Virgin Islands. This is about roughly the same as in the 1980s, but down since the 1930s when there were 121 of these institutions. don't think that students um, at HBCUs have forgotten what that fight or what that struggle is in our current fight and our current struggle. What I think has happened is that there is a perception of how the gratitude is supposed to be shown. And I think that is where the biggest disservice is, not only to current students, but to the fight and struggle itself. Our gratefulness will not look the same as maybe it did for those individuals who matriculated um, maybe five years or 10 years, even 30 years after these institutions were built and incorporated. Um, we show gratitude in many different ways. And I think that if we can recognize that, then you will see the how how we are saying thank you and how the current students um, are saying thank you and, and paying homage to the ancestors that came before them that built these institutions for them. So so no, I don't think that the the, the fight or the struggle has been forgotten and I don't think it ever will be forgotten especially when you're referring to specifically HBCU students who walk the very area and land where our ancestors walked and we reside in buildings or we are um, taking classes in buildings that they built we can never forget that. My response to this question is yes only because um, I think in this instance, the onus is on the institution to emphasize this information, to ensure that it's built into the curriculum, um, especially as a historically black college and university. This is um, a space where, you know, some of the content, some of the lectures can be culturally relevant to the students, you know, um, relatable to the students. And in this case, emphasizing that history and some of the lectures, it's important because it provides the why and the purpose for a lot of students like myself uh, as we kind of you know, traverse through society. A real one. Um, 
they should have a real connection. I, I think the 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 best way to grow a community is to show that it's a community off top. And so what that means is being approachable uh, to your students. I'm not saying you have to have an open door policy, but just being somebody uh, who they can go to and, and truly voice their concerns to. Um, a, a HBCU president should never be entirely too busy to meet with any of the students there. Um, a HBCU president should definitely take into account all the factors that lead into a, a successful college. And, and most of that is uh, the students. You know, with, with those students, there wouldn't be any jobs, to be perfectly honest with you. So um, a great HBCU president can take in all the, the working parts and build it into a, a great machine. So um, if you're going to be a great HBCU president, your level of connectivity is great. The media's constant question of HBCU relevancy, it is disheartening because our institutions um, are being compared using metrics that don't apply to us, um, that we can't you know, relate to in this instance. And a good example is disparity of funding, or excuse me, funding um, disparity in between HBCUs and PWIs. There is a huge disparity um, with funding. And then secondly, the number of Pell eligible students on an HBCU campus, the number of first generation um, students on, on HBCU campuses. They're completely um, different from predominantly white institutions. And so, you know, understanding that the resources that are needed um, at HBCUs in comparison to PWIs, again, it's completely different. Um, and then lastly, the numbers speak for themselves as far as HBCUs are the largest producer of blacks into the um, middle class. HBCUs are the largest producer of blacks into STEM fields. And I think that's commendable within itself. And so again, the numbers speak for themselves, um, knowing that HBCUs are doing the good work um, in comparison to a lot of our peer institutions. Purpose or what is needed, or why we should put it out, because this is not only for us as a whole, for the current students. This is for the future students who want to be able to attend a school where there are people who look just like them and are all about them, care for them, treat them as a family, and the whole you know, embodiment of being a HBCU student, whether you're black, you're white, Hispanic, Asian, whatever you want to be. And how black colleges help re-identify what it means to be black and educated in America. So I know that one, before I got to my HBCU, I attended, I attended a, a predominantly white high school and there, like, I didn't know how important it was to be black because they didn't really force that issue. And um, I remember, I just even remember like during the times we would have black history programs and all of the white people would get checked out because my history wasn't important enough to them for them to learn to sit down for an hour and 30 minutes at the most and listen to my history when I learned about their history every day. So... Something like that, you know, being at an HBCU, I learned my history. Like before I got to my HBCU, I knew little to nothing about African-American history. Only and like when you run into a mental health problem, you might not go for, like you might not seek out help or you might feel like if you seek out help that that'll make you like a, a weirdo or outsider or something like that, but it's not the case. As we progress in our understanding of the importance of mental health and how that has a direct impact on our ability to form relationships, our ability to be successful, not only in the classroom, but in the workplace, there's more emphasis being put on this idea of self-care 
um, the the thought of seeking therapy, speaking speaking to someone, having some sort of outlet. I believe that we are just seeing more of that play out in our HBCUs. HBCUs have done a really good job at prioritizing mental mental health awareness among the student body. Um, I feel like in a lot of uh, the students that attend, especially the African-American students, I feel like this may be considered like a safe haven um, where they can talk about trials and tribulations that we've experienced by being Black or by growing up in certain areas and finding camaraderie with other students and also having the resources geared towards us. These are always constantly reminding us like if you if you have a problem that we can't solve, then you you probably should go up there to the go over to the resource building with the um the counselor. So I was not thinking of mental health and the way that we have conversations about it today, but I am more than certain that it played a role in my performance. So the question is, is mental health ever a topic at your HBCU? And I'm sure it's more of a conversation now, and it's probably a conversation that um, some people were having back when I attended college. Um, I'm just, once again, not sure how big of a role it played. Um, it certainly, through a number of different organizations, were things that I, be, I began thinking about more. Um, but once again, not in the same way that I think about it today. And so when I say that, it's what does that mean? So today I am much more aware of when I'm feeling overwhelmed. I am much more aware of identifying times when I need to take a step back. I need to relax. I need to go and talk to someone. Um, I need some time alone, some time in prayer. I am much more aware of those moments than I was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I was certainly thinking more of a, oh, this is college. This is a part of life. Um, you push through. Or if you find yourself feeling completely overwhelmed at a time, go take a nap. Boom, everything is solved. Um, and so I think that um, I probably did not speak about it in terms of that, but I, I've always been fortunate enough to have folks in my life that I could talk to about different things happening. So I'm sure that I utilized those outlets. I simply didn't call it by the same thing. I wasn't thinking of it in terms of mental health versus just what's in front of me. What is my schedule like? What are those external things? things that I can focus on, rearrange and fix versus what are some things within me that may be causing me to feel overwhelmed or that may be causing me to have a certain outlook, perception or view on what is occurring around me. My mental health has played a significant role in how I've performed at these universities. So at FAMU, I felt I felt more connected. I felt more understood. Um, I also felt like my professors and the counseling center um, and the overall administration, I feel like they understood that academic performance was tied not only to our uh, physical health, and not only to like our spiritual health, but to our academic performance.
made me choose to be a uh, want to be a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Um, definitely was the influences of my aunts. Um, both of my aunts actually are line sisters, and yeah, they crossed in '76, I believe it was. I think their line name was SS Booby Train. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> they probably would kill me for saying that. Um. <laughs> so they both were like very monumental uh, influences on me in terms of just watching how they move. Um, one of my aunts was a teacher, and I don't remember what my other aunt did, but just like she just always was just so poised and just like put together, not necessarily like just put together well to do, but just like down to earth and just so I don't know all about business at the same time, and that just was interesting and intriguing to me. And then when I got to campus, uh, Philander Smith College, at the time, the Zetas was really like running the yard because it was only one Delta. And I still just was like doing research. So that's when I started like delving deep into the research of Delta and just seeing <clears throat> that the first act of service was participating in the suffrage march when people didn't even want them there. People were throwing like rocks and stones at them, like just reading about that and reading the tenacity and then finding out that one of the founders is from Kansas City, Missouri, you already know. <laughs> it was like, oh, okay. Like, that sealed the deal for me. Alpha Phi Alpha came to uh, Gary, Indiana uh, by the name of Paul Pearson. Uh, he was a recruit. And, you know what I'm saying? First of all, it was a college fair, but it was like probably eight colleges there. You know what I'm saying? Like, Small and it was like the biggest convention center in Gary. Now it's in the hood, but it's the biggest convention center. And I was like, man, you know what I'm saying? Besides all these colleges in Indiana, does no one really care about Gary? You know what I'm saying? Does nobody really care about the futures here? Like besides the colleges that can get here in a two hour drive, was there anybody else? Um, Paul, Paul Pearson came and like, like on the spot, I offered me a scholarship or whatever. And I'm like, all right. And then I saw like his, you know what I'm saying, what he had and how he carried himself. And when I got to the campus, those brothers actually helped me move in and was talking to me and was mentoring me. So, um, and then also to the leadership positions, like where they were in SGA and everything like that. And at that point, it was like, all right, my mind is, my mind is made up, to be honest with you. Because people who, who had such high rank in social life and, and still wanted to help me out was, was, was amazing. Uh, so I just recently moved to Atlanta. So I have been researching like the alumni chapters there to settle into one so that um, I can start going back to doing the the social services. Um, I know they have like a lot of fundraisers that they do there and so I would love to be a part of just in the environment and not only just doing something that I love but doing it with people who also have some of the same values and morals as me as well is going to be like epic so that is what I'm planning to do I just got to finish researching these chapters because there's a lot of them and I need to find the one that's right there in my area um, where we can start working together and making these changes happen because you know we we need some changes right now, especially with this uh, Corona mache going on. I feel as though Philander Smith College prepared me for the real world by introducing more of a struggle because where there is not struggle, there's not progress. Homecoming is, is freshman was the best thing of my life. I wasn't a people person. I wasn't talking to nobody at all. Like I'd be by myself, me. So when they had homecoming, I was like, okay, let me try it. And I met my friends. I was attracted to Finley Smith College when I attended their Blessed Mike in eighth grade. I was also in a show style band throughout my high school career and my director, my band director was a alumni from Mississippi Valley State University and he took us on HBCU tours to HBCU homecomings and they were lit. So I always had the notion that I would be attending an HBCU, I just didn't know that I would be attending an HBCU in Arkansas. 
um, I was following behind a boy who was an upperclassman attending Alabama a and &M. We were supposed to attend there together upon me graduating and whatnot, and we broke up. <laughs> we broke up the week of graduation. So I had already accepted my scholarship. I had already paid my room deposit. I just, you know, I just didn't have a guy. And I just so happened to find the love of my life uh, the, a month before fall semester was supposed to begin. And he and my cousin convinced me to attend an HBCU in Arkansas. And I chose Flanders Smith College. I believe the best um, event on Philander Smith College has definitely got to be the 100 years of psychology by the Arkansas black psychology professionals. It was a wonderful event. It was a phenomenal event. I actually cried at the event. I cried because I was in awe. I was in disbelievement. Um, and just, I was in, I had a just great gratefulness i was very grateful to be in a room full of unapolog unapologetic black professionals who endured endured a very ooh, very trying time in becoming a psychologist and i chose to come to this hbcu because of friends from my high school a lot of them came out here in the past they used to always come back and help us in our high school program so it, it it kind of led me to come down here. So long story short, it's been much of a family oriented experience for me. I do love all the music professors in the fine arts building, the music education major, as well as the education uh, professors as well. They have helped me along the way. I'm currently working on the practices so I can student teach next semester, then hopefully I'll be graduating in the fall. I chose UAPB because honestly, not even a lot of y'all scholarship. Um, they offered me a full ride scholarship with my GPA and my ACT. Um, even before I got here, um, I went on an HBCU college tour my sophomore year of high school, um, and the uh, Alpha chapter back home, is they kind of like put it together in a sense, and Philander was the first HBCU we touched, and then UAPB was the second, and I fell in love with the campus. As soon as I, like, as soon as I got off the bus, I'm like, yo, <laughs> this me, like, you know, um, so finished the tour, went back home. And um, one of the alumni from back home was like, hey, we're going to Lion Fever Day, you should come. Now she was a member at the church, but I didn't know she was the alumni president for UAPB. So she funded my way, got me here, and when I filled out the application, that's when they told me that I had a full ride scholarship based on my GPA ACT. So I was like, sick, like, so, so that's why UAPB is my school. Um, as far as my mental health and my well-being, and as far as being a black student at HBCU, um, I love it because you really feel the fact, like you really feel the love, not just from your professors, but from your colleagues, your classmates, just students and staff. Um, like you can tell that they really care about you and want to see you succeed. Like they gonna go above and beyond to make sure you get to not just graduation, but that you got a job and secure in your career after you graduate. That's why I repeat yeah, PB. Uh, my name is Nicodemus Muntz. I'm a junior here at the university majoring in political science. Um, the reason that I chose an HBCU is because I wanted to get an experience of being around people that look like me, that were trying to go somewhere with their lives, and just having that uplifting community that HBCUs are known for. Was really want two things, um, family history, but also out of necessity. Um, my grandmother was, uh, both of my grandparents lived in Pine Bluff, and I was having trouble um, just acclimating myself into a, a, at another institution. So they were like, come to Pine Bluff, come to UAPB. Um, once there, though, um, I really started to appreciate um, what UAPB had to offer um, and realizing how many of my aunts and uncles had gone to school there and graduated from there. But also um, that everybody was like-minded or not even like-minded, but just had an appreciation for who I was and who I was trying to develop into. into. Okay. Um, what's your favorite event? Um, well, 
it's a couple of events that's my favorite. Uh, one has always been homecoming. And again, to see a group of African Americans come together for the common good of the institution. I can remember my very first homecoming and they do and they're doing the alumni um, assembly. And that's when all of the alumni from all over the nation comes in and they bring in their donations for the school. And I just remember sitting in that gymnasium thinking, wow, these are my people. And um, we're all looking to make a better way and a better life, not only for ourselves, but for generations to come. Honestly, I would say my favorite part of homecoming was definitely the tailgate and the parade. With the parade this year, they changed up the whole route. We went outside the gates. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, we love to go outside the gates. It was good. It was really good. I genuinely enjoyed myself um, and getting out there. Uh, the tailgate, for sure, it was amazing meeting new sorors and, you know, uh, interacting overall with my student body and just overall just enjoying the fellowship and whatnot, especially with this being my senior year, too. It was definitely bittersweet, so I would say I genuinely enjoyed myself. Tailgate. I the tailgate. I like the parade. Okay. The parade was good. The Why was the was tailgate good. your favorite part? Uh, you already know the food, man. Okay, absolutely. Food was good, you know? We love to eat, absolutely. But I, I liked everything. Okay. I liked everything about it. Was there anything that could have been better? Absolutely. Communication. I think okay. uh, if we, as students, student leaders, and the administration would have communicated a little bit better, things would have ran a lot smoother. Uh, we would have had more participation from the community. Right. Yeah. If y'all were a. The students at Philander Smith College have asked me, why do I rep? my HBCU. I have two of them, Philander Smith College and Dillon University, where I graduated from. And I represent those institutions because I feel a part of an environment where I can help students grow, where I can help students learn, and where I can help students achieve. I enjoy my colleagues and working with them to make a difference to create an environment where students can learn, grow, and achieve. That's why I represent my HBCU. I love the mission. Philander Smith College is dedicated to those students so that they can graduate as academically accomplished students, grounded as advocates for social justice and determined to change the world for the better. At Dillard University, where I graduated from, I learned that Dillard University is dedicated to the development of young men and young women to live a good life, to make a good living. For what is it that surpasses a life that gives intimate joy and upward satisfaction? I represent my institutions with joy and pride. The college moment that made me feel beyond just being a number or a statistic happened early on. It's when you go over that big hill, I think it's RWE Jones Drive, and you come down and Gramlin is basically a campus that seems like it's in a valley. And you see the sign, Gramlin State University, where everybody is somebody. And I knew from my very first visit there, uh, when the lights were illuminated, it was uh, early evening uh, when I went to the campus the first time for a visit that I had a chance to be somebody because that university allowed me to feel like from the moment I stepped foot on campus that everybody is somebody. I was more than a statistic. I was more than a freshman incoming. I was more than a student. Uh, I was a person and a blank canvas that had an opportunity uh, to paint with broad strokes and learn as much as I can during the time I was blessed to be at that university. So I knew from day one uh, that I was more than a statistic. going on. She couldn't let's, let's just have a second segment of all the names of Corona. Um, Ro, Ro. Carisha, please, as Owen would say. <laughs> please, so Kukaraji. Rona, Rona. I heard Rona. I heard somebody say Cora. I heard Corona the shape of Ivory. Oh. <laughs> we will be there. And we are coming to you good from Good Friday. Um, good this Friday. is a special announcement, okay? I would like to thank you all for working with us during the COVID-19 crisis. And I just want y'all to know that on the third day, Jesus rose again. Duh, duh, duh. Your brains, no matter how they are right now, will rise again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's all I got. And your spirits will rise again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, and your finances will rise again. And I'm gonna rise to 
wash my hands. He could prevent the spread of COVID. Yeah. Woo. Woo. Great job, everybody. Sorry. Okay. Now we're going to do the QA. All right. Um, now is the time for any questions or concerns from anyone. And um, me and my classmates will be happy to answer. What was y'all biggest challenge while creating this documentary? Let me see. Um, well, our biggest challenge, I would say per se, is you know coming together to getting it done as well as facing adversities with the virus and everything. Because of course, you know, we're not at school, so we would have to sit there and deal with what we have. And based off of doing things with what we have, you know, it was more of a struggle because we all aren't used to what was going on, but we had to put that aside and, you know, get things done in a timely manner. So that way we can present the documentary for not only ourselves, but to you guys as the students as well. One of my biggest um, challenges was working through coronavirus and not being with my teammates. Like, it was really hard. Like, we all over the country trying to make this come together. So that was really challenging. Okay. All right. We have a um, question in the chat. Is um. Uh, by Ms. Bell, it says, um, how has attending an a historical black college impacted your character? That's one of them. And I'll say um, it impacted me because it, um, it gave me the opportunity to get close to my roots and um, to be able to um, understand the way we work and how our brains are operate in the ways we go about helping ourselves. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Uh, I want to know, has this, like, you know, I just have a great appreciation for this film that y'all did was able to put together, especially the circumstances that y'all are going through currently, you know, saying to try to finish up y'all school year. But I want to know, because I thought it was very, you know, just dope. And um, has this inspired any of y'all that was in the uh, part of the production of the, the film to possibly pursue careers in like photography, film, or any type of art? just all based off learning this whole experience moving forward.
say that that has allowed me to open like but I never had a problem with like stuff. It's just like a lot of what I say is on that time. So I think we put me speak at volumes and being able to up makes me feel more safe. And I was like pursuing Kinda in a mix of already having a YouTube channel. I got like 120 subs. Actually, do like gaming videos. Probably reaction videos. So I never really had a problem. It's like the it really came natural to me. But all in all, I really had fun. Um, I can definitely say it inspired me more. Um, my ultimate goal after graduation is to go into the broadcast field. Um, anyway, so just creating this project from scratch really just, um, confirmed that, you know, being in the media field, it really is just a blank canvas and, you know, um, you're the artist, so you can create whatever you want. Um, and, you know, when you have a group of other creative minds who can work together and maybe think of different visions that you didn't think of that really makes the project um, flourish even more in the end. So it definitely made me um, more inspired to, you know, pursue my career in television after graduation. You guys have a, um, another question that says, this is Charisma, and my question is, as a student now, how do you plan to celebrate your HBCU moving forward? Is there another level of appreciation for it now after doing the documentary? I plan on showing more support and this upcoming semester will be my um, senior year. So I plan on participating in everything, going to everything and making sure that I'm a philander woman. Okay. Any other students? Oh, my bad, my As far as like move, yeah, it is a level of appreciation, of a lot more than I ever felt. I never really know HBCU personally. Once I actually came to like college or even thought about college, I was actually thinking about to CA Lander. I ain't know nothing about at all. I knew. Only because one of my best friends go to music down there like every weekend. The like homecomings, all of that came to this school for some which was wild. I enjoyed it. Full experience. And that one. not only that, I like the family aspect of being at a HBCU because a lot of people you know they really don't get that at home. So knowing that you have it here makes you really appreciate the people that you're around. Like a lot of kind of lack that feeling, feeling like they don't have that confidence with that self because it's people support. Because it's hard times. At the end of the day, you're still a college student. It's hard at times. You struggle. That you got people that's going to back you. Up. 100%. Right? So the next question, um, and I see that we have, I'm going to ask the class first, we have some uh, HBCU alum and uh, 
on the call. So is it okay if we open it up to everyone, guys, for this next question? Okay. Yes, ma'am. So the next question says, when considering Barbie want to say hello. When considering who should be the president of an HBCU, what are your thoughts on the importance of them being a product of an HBCU? I feel like perception is everything and character is everything in that mindset. So I feel like, yes, you might have the skills because you went to college, but do you have the experience of attending the HBCU? Because HBCU problems are not everybody's issue. Um, and if you've never been a part of that or ever experienced that, you wouldn't understand what what that consists of. So when those problems arise in the HBCU that you're serving, it wouldn't it wouldn't really. Um, I'm not gonna say you wouldn't know what to do, but I think it'll help with you have common knowledge of the situation beforehand. I also feel like it's important that they are a product of an HBCU because nobody understands HBCU students like former HBCU students. It's a certain grit and grind that HBCUs teach you. And not saying PWIs don't, but I know for a fact, somebody from your tribe gonna know how to relate to somebody that's within your tribe. So you don't wanna have teachers or people that don't look like you, let alone a president. So I think that's really important. Leaders are just as valuable as us and they need to know and relate to us. out to help and seeing what we're doing, asking those questions about the school, seeing how we do classes and things to basically showing like so it's kind of like kind of like a mom and dad type of program and it's kind of like that for it's more so like tough look basically someone generally help you forward to give you something somewhat too much to that. So it's time for a Um, as an alum of Philander um, and observing other products of HBCUs, those that are administrators and just students um, that attend HBCUs now, I've noticed that what a president produces in their term makes a huge difference based upon where they came from. Um, as Ms. Davis was, as not Dr., I believe it was Tara as she was saying about um, how you relate, you understand, you kind of have a better understanding of what you're coming into. Um, I think number one, just from the battles that HBCUs face with funding and that being like a major issue across the board, I believe that when you come into a term as a president for an HBCU, you have to truly understand what's important and have a grasp of what battles you have to fight immediately and what battles you can shred, you have a little bit more time to strategize um, for. But I do believe that HBCU should be led by their own kind. I also believe like things like that also lead to um, it's like keeping generational wealth in the family. HBCUs are the same concept. You keep 
you keep family business in the family. And so I feel like if you come from an HBCU, it's like it's like when they tell you don't sell grandma's house. It's the same concept when it comes to HBCUs. You don't need you don't need to allow someone who doesn't have the experience or doesn't have the uh, um the <laughs> who doesn't have the um understanding of how this works to come in. That's like selling grandma's house. I feel like when you go to a PWI, it's nothing against you being there, but in the midst of you learning about because all you ever learn at a PWI, in my personal experience, um, is how to survive being the minority. But what happens when you're when you come to an HBCU and you aren't the minority anymore? You have to you go from learning how to survive to learning how to strive, and those are two different situations. So that's why it's so important to me for my president to be a product of an HBCU. Yes, yeah, Okay. Are there any other questions, comments? We're going to kind of work towards wrapping up the Q&A session. Leah, you can take it away. Um, I almost dropped my phone. But um, I just want to thank everyone for coming out tonight um, and supporting us throughout this entire process. Um, it was really tedious, but we made it happen. Um, I want to thank my classmates, aka the production team, you know, for still, you know, sticking it through and, you know, giving our, our best and just adjusting to the circumstances with everything happening with Corona. Um, uh, thank you to Ms. Bradford for editing and putting this together. Together, Thank you to um, Dr. A for bringing this idea to us. And um, pushing us to make it happen. Um, and yeah, thank you. Like I said, thank you to everybody who supported us. Thank you for everybody who joined the video, who shared the video, who shared the flyers and everything. So just, and the interviewers, thank you. Um, we appreciate that. Um, so yeah, just thanks to everybody. We appreciate it. Hopefully you guys will be seeing this documentary on uh, a big screen coming soon. <laughs> Manifestation. All right. Thanks, everybody. We are going to end the session.